Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Just a few days ago, there was a formal statement issued by Oral Roberts University. The statement said this. It said, Oral Roberts University alumni have gone to the uttermost bounds of the earth for the last 50 years, bringing hope and healing to millions. We are not surprised that John would try to reach out to these isolated people in order to share God's love. We are deeply saddened to hear of his death. And it was signed, Dr. William Wilson, president of Oral Roberts University. Now, of course, ORU's official statement here is in reference to one of social media's most talked about stories of recent weeks. It's the story of John Allen Chow. A zealous 26-year-old guy, a self-proclaimed missionary, and he was just determined to go out and share the message of Jesus Christ with an isolated tribe on North Sentinel Island in the Indian Ocean. This tribe is estimated to be 30,000 years old, extremely isolated, completely cut off from the outside world, but it is known for its aggressive resistance to any and all outsiders. Marco Polo actually wrote about this tribe back in the 13th century. He declared in his journal, quote, they are a most violent and cruel generation who seem to eat everybody they catch. Now, The Guardian did a story on this tribe in 2006, and their article said this. It said, while their cannibalism has never been proven, Little has changed here in the remotest parts of the Bay of Bengal over seven centuries, and Delhi's furthest flung outpost is still occupied by aggressive Stone Age tribes who hunt wild pigs and fish with arrows, believe that birds talk to spirits, and lack both the skills to make fire and a word to describe a number greater than two. In its history, this particular tribe has survived temporary occupations by the Burmese, the British, the Japanese. An estimated 2,000 of its tribe members were killed in a deadly tsunami, and yet the tribe remains. And it remains a big mystery. Who are these people? What's its culture like? What are their traditions and practices? How do they live We know that approaching this tribe is pretty much a suicidal act. In fact, it is illegal to approach North Sentinel Island unless you have permission. Now, if you're going to be near the shores, it's best to keep your distance and you should keep your wits about you. This advice would have saved a couple of lives back in 2006, the lives of Sundar Raj and Pandit Tiwari. They were crab fishermen back in 2006, and they got drunk, apparently got drunk on wine. On the 27th of January, 2006, they beached their boat on the shores of this very island. And there were other fishermen who were well off the shore, still in their boats, who were sort of watching what happened next. And from out of the trees, these tribal warriors emerge, dressed only in loincloths, and they're shouting and carrying on. They emerge onto the beach, and they kill these two guys with axes and machetes. The Indian Coast Guard was summoned to investigate this. And as it flew over the scene of the attack, the helicopter was struck time and time again by arrows. These guys were just going full bore on the offense against the reconnaissance helicopter. The pilot realized immediately it would be another suicide mission to try to set this thing down, so he just 
flew off, but the downdraft from the helicopter rotor blades blew away some of the top sand over two shallow graves, exposing the sliced-up bodies of the dead fishermen. And even back in 2006, opinions about this story split. Some of the relatives of the dead protested and petitioned, and they wanted justice and compensation. In fact, they wanted the Indian government to compensate them for their loss. But the local authorities were pretty sympathetic to this local tribe and tribe sovereignty. And there had been obvious warnings to anybody who might come ashore, don't do it, right? This is not a surprise. They felt like the tribe had a right to exist, unaccosted by the outside world. And it had the right to meet any potential interlopers, anything they might consider to be a threat with whatever force it deemed appropriate. Now, I've been wondering in my own mind as I read these stories, what are the thought processes of this tribe? Like, how would they process a boat that's beached on the shores or these strangers who were hopping out with who knows what their intentions are? Do they have a notion, any notion of a friendly outsider? Do they just see all foreigners as potential conquerors or predators or devils? Uh, maybe something we haven't even imagined yet, right? Has the isolation of tens of thousands of years evolved in this culture ideas that are just so wild and wacky and so outside the mainstream, so outside civilized cultures, so far removed from us, you know, with our iPhones and our hybrid cars and retweeting and 4K televisions and Fitbits and 3D printing and Google Translate and all that, right? When the North Sentinel tribesmen saw this helicopter flying around back in 2006, did they jive with the concept of helicopter? Or were they so superstitiously informed that they kind of saw the tribal equivalent, you know, the North Sentinel equivalent of the prophecy of the fifth trumpet from the biblical book of Revelation, you know, in chapter 7, where it says, the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, with many horses running into battle, they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Did they look up in the sky and see a monster, a deadly locust with a tail like a scorpion, and breath so powerful that it could open up a man's grave, right? How does the primitive mind process something like a helicopter? Now, we don't know. We don't know what they think. We don't know how they think. Here's the one thing we do know. Here at the end of the year 2018, almost 2019, here's what we know. The North Sentinel tribe is deadly, and it's illegal to step foot on the island. John Allen Chow knew this. John had previously tried to contact these people. He had the ultimate goal of sharing the Christian salvation message, right? A goal that was reinforced at ORU and probably through a religious family and culture. His diary talks about the day before he was killed. He'd actually managed to reach the island the day before. John was carrying his Bible, and he had come bearing gifts. He tried to give the tribe's people a fish, and he also tried to give them a football, and this guy was persistent. He had a diary, and John wrote in his diary these words. He said, I heard the whoops and shouts from the hunt. I made sure to stay out of arrow range, but unfortunately that meant I was also out of good hearing range. So I got a little closer as they, about six from what I could see, yelled at me. I tried to parrot their words back to them. They burst out laughing most of the time, so they probably were saying bad words or insulting me. I hollered, My name is John. I love you, and Jesus loves you. I regret I began to panic slightly as I saw them string arrows in their bows. I picked up the fish and threw it towards them. 
They kept coming. I paddled like I never have in my life back to the boat. I felt some fear, but mainly was disappointed. They didn't accept me right away. According to John's diary, there was a boy in the tribe who shot an arrow, and it struck the Bible that he was carrying. The Bible actually blocked the arrow. Potentially, it kept him from being harmed physically. There might be like an inferred religious message in that, oh, the Bible once again is the salvation. And John was determined he was going to go back the next day. He'd paid fishermen to sneak him up there, to smuggle him up to this point right off the island. I think it's the equivalent of a little over 200 U.S. dollars. And then he would kayak back and forth between the fishing boat and and the shore. And he knew this was illegal. He knew it was dangerous, and he had been warned. But I'm guessing that he was holding on to the words of the Bible. Like in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Honestly, I think John fancied himself kind of a modern-day Elizabeth Elliot. And if you don't know who Elizabeth Elliot is, real fast, her husband was a missionary. His name is Jim Elliot. And he was a missionary in eastern Ecuador back in 1956. And he was killed by the very tribe that he was trying to evangelize. Now, this is what's interesting. Elizabeth Elliot went back there. She actually returned to the tribe and befriended the members of the very tribe that had killed her husband. She converted a great many people in the tribe. That's the story that's often told. And then she came back and began to travel and tell her story. And she had a a radio show. She authored over 20 books. And she spoke to audiences in churches and auditoriums all around the world, talking about how her husband died in the name of Jesus Christ. And yet... Thanks to his good graces, she went back and was able to finish the work. So she was this kind of religious hero, this Christian hero. And I'm guessing that John probably saw himself in the same light. I'm going to go and I'm going to overcome the dangers and I'm going to reach the unreachable and and I'm going to leave a lasting legacy as a God warrior for Jesus Christ and all that. I mean, the guy was a true believer, right? There's no doubt the guy was absolutely 1000% a true believer, In his diary, he had written, Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have heard or even had the chance to hear your name? And we're going to come back to that, okay? We're going to come back to that. But this is the hero narrative. You know, this is the martyr narrative. John was afraid. I mean, he was admittedly afraid. On the morning of his death, he wrote a letter to his parents He said these words, he said, You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. This is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand. And I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping in their own language, as Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 states. John signed the letter to his parents with the words, Glory to God alone. Within a few hours of writing that letter, John's body was lying dead on the beach, a beach still considered, even now, so hostile that the idea of retrieving the body, wherever it is, wherever it's been put or if it's been buried or whatever, retrieving that body is a dubious and obviously dangerous affair. John's family has issued a public statement. They said that they forgave the tribe. We forgive those reportedly responsible for his death. And to their credit, I mean, the family does seem to understand that John knew what he was doing and he placed himself in harm's way. Well, enter an organization called International Christian Concern. ICC, they are completely outraged at the notion 
that one of God's precious children was so violently cut down. And a spokesperson said this. They said, We here at International Christian Concern are extremely concerned by the reports of an American missionary being murdered in India's Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Our thoughts and prayers go out to both John's family and friends. A full investigation must be launched in this murder, and those responsible must be brought to justice. But ICC still wasn't done. They painted a persecution narrative, talking about how India has a long, long history of torturing and murdering Christians, and that this, the case of John Chow, was just the latest example. Quote, Many Christians fear that this may be the new normal for their community, as Hindu radicals and others have been allowed to attack Christians and other minority communities with impunity. India must take steps to counter the growing wave of intolerance and violence. Now, you and I see these reports on the news, and we are screaming at the television, right? This ain't persecution. It's not religious persecution. This is the illegal encroachment of an unwanted and potentially dangerous guy, and we'll get to that, dangerous guy onto an island where, for all we know, for all you and I know, the inhabitants might see a football and think that it looks just like the magic fish head that would anger Ubu, the shark-finned tsunami god. And because I'm guessing that despite their isolation, they likely have learned how to swear, they would say, what the fuck is that guy doing with Ubu? He's going to get us all tsunamied again. He's going to get us, we're all going to drown. Somebody needs to take him out. Hang on just a second. Wait, look, his lips are moving. His mouth is moving. Just like our shaman did right before he bashed himself to death with a petrified coconut. No good can come of this. Hide the children. Let the tribal warriors assemble. Somebody fire up the hibachi. This danger must be abated, right? Who knows what they're thinking? (laughs) I mean, this may be what they're thinking for all you and I. I don't know. Now, if I can pause here for a moment and address the fact that this story does obviously provide opportunities for humor and some kind of dark humor out there. And I have partaken in it on social media. Um, I shared the clip of that guy that seen from American God season one. He dies with like 150 arrows to the body in three seconds. And under the uh, Meme is a caption that says, pardon me, do you have a moment to talk about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That one's really popular. I did share the one that said uh, that Facebook where you can mark yourself safe, and I marked myself safe from tribal arrows. Uh, I've seen the one floating around that says, I used to be a Christian missionary, but then I took an arrow to the knee. That's a line borrowed from Skyrim. Uh, There's a really dark one out there. It shows this dead body face down on a beach, and it's got arrows, bloody arrows in the back. And the caption says, the new missionary position. Now, it's very possible that some of this is unnecessarily cruel, okay? And there have been a few people online who have chastised me for making light of the whole thing. I mean, the guy was a victim, and I agree, he's a victim of brainwashing. This guy was so completely brainwashed that he attempted a suicide mission to appease his magic daddy. And in that regard, you're absolutely right. He does deserve our compassion, empathy, and genuine grief. His family, his parents have lost a son. His siblings have lost a brother. Uh, He has essentially forfeited his entire future for a superstitious idea. And so, I mean, I understand the idea of not trotting upon their grief. I understand your concerns to a point. Now, I can't speak for everybody else. I'll just talk about my own perspective. But, you know, the sharing of these types of jokes and memes and whatever is, for me, not as much about John Chow as it is about drawing a big, red, flashing circle around the insanity of it all. These types of religious crusades... 
especially under this narrative that the very God who apparently had told John to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. This God is supposed to have informed his trip to the island, right? Commanded him to go or encouraged him to go, allowed him to get there, allowed him to reach the shore, and then sat on his omnipotent ass and did nothing when the tribal warriors unloaded their bows. There's also an undeniable reality that John was warned not to go there. Don't do it. Multiple times he was warned. Don't do this. It's a suicide mission. John knew they had the capability for and a long history of executing outsiders, as they saw pretty much everybody outside the tribe as a threat. And while I do acknowledge this guy was a victim of bad ideas, you know, he was a victim of brainwashing, religious brainwashing. He also willingly walked on to the North Sentinel Island Archery Range. Having been used as a target only the day before, okay? On top of that, and this has widely been discussed out there in the ether, John was not just bringing the good news of Jesus Christ. John was bringing with him a whole host, a whole army of potential pathogens onto an island which likely had no resistance or immunity to them. They certainly didn't jive with concepts like vaccines. You know, you and I get the flu and we're miserable for a few weeks and we recover. The North Sentinel tribesmen get the flu. It's a death sentence. Who knows what this guy might have been carrying along with him inside his body and one handshake One sneeze, one point of contact might set in motion the mechanism which would wipe out the tribe. And John's visit honestly doesn't make any sense. In the context of Jesus, it would make a hell of a lot more sense for Jesus, Jesus Christ, to just, you know, walk on water over to the island and then he just delivers the message personally. Jesus already speaks all languages. He could totally understand and communicate. We already know Jesus is okay with puncture wounds. We know this. He can always resurrect and try again if the plan should fail. Why would the all-powerful, eternal Jesus Christ need John Allen Chow in the first place? On top of all this, many Christian traditions say that those who never hear the gospel in the first place, they're never introduced to the good news or the salvation message, they are guaranteed not to go to hell. If you never get a chance to choose, if you never hear the salvation message, then you are guaranteed to go to heaven. Okay, now, I don't see that in the Bible. I don't see that represented in the Christian Bible. But many Christians hold to this. And if that's the case, why in the world would you ever ever go to the island in the first place? Why spill the beans? Why complicate things? Why actually make it harder for them to get to heaven when they're already guaranteed to go there in their ignorance? Just leave them alone. Now you've got all these people and governments and families and resources tied up in this feverish debate about how to locate John's body and then how to get it off the island. Right? They want to retrieve the body for a proper burial and whatever. Now, please forgive me if this sounds harsh, my friends, but nobody, nobody should retrieve John's body from the island. Nobody else should go ashore. No people, no boats, no helicopters, no nothing. Now, I understand how this idea might grieve his family. I get that. But there's a greater good at work here, and it requires that we just stay away. John made his choice. He's like the guy who isn't equipped to climb Mount Everest, and he's not trained or conditioned to climb Mount Everest and tries it anyway and who dies on the mountain and then freezes solid right there on the mountain at the upper altitude somewhere. And the retrieval of his body is so impractical and so dangerous and, frankly, not our problem. He's not a soldier who died on the battlefield. He's not... You know, the victim of a plane crash, or he wasn't taken in a hostage situation, he wasn't killed in a freak accident. This guy knowingly 
and willingly walked into the movie Apocalypto. And as tragic as that is, this is the truth of it. We should, we have to leave him there. Now, I don't in any way celebrate the death of John Allen Chow. I, I'm not happy he's dead. I don't celebrate his death. I'm not giggly and gleeful about his death, you know. It's terrible. It's a tremendous waste. But I will gladly use John's story as yet another example of how superstition distorts rational thinking, of how, you know, it's really true. The world has plenty of youth. What we need is a fountain of smart. And I want to refute yet again why John's situation is not representative of an attack, an assault, persecution on Christ warriors as part of this persecution narrative, right? This is not persecution. This is an example of how not to think, of what not to do, of who not to trust, including, including and especially Jesus Christ, who, if he existed, actually set John up for failure. Jesus set John Allen Chow up to fail. Oral Roberts University should have issued a different statement instead of the evangelical spin that they put out a few days ago. ORU should have said something else. I think they should have said this. They should have said, a religious faith should be a personal faith. Don't bother others with it. Don't endanger yourself for it. Don't bribe people so you can break the law because of it. If God exists, and if God wants people to hear, to understand, to accept, and receive him, he's God, and it's not fair for someone who can't be hurt to order you into places where you can. John deserved better from his religion. John, you deserved better. You deserve better from this university, from its staff and leadership, from the superstition that it sells. And this story, your story, has prompted us as an organization to reconsider our position on the Bible, on its God, and God's great commission. We're going to commit ourselves, our entire future, to fighting this kind of insanity to make sure no one else gets hurt. And we're going to take a really long, hard look at this whole faith thing. So many people harmed and killed, so much senseless loss out there, and for a message that somebody else should be delivering in the first place. We apologize to John, to his family, to all of our students, and to humanity for informing John's magical thinking, and we will issue a new policy built on a foundation of safety, responsibility, rationality, empathy, legality, and respect. Oh, I would love to see that statement from ORU. What good news that would be. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com